So now two times in the row, in the row, in the row, two times in the row, row, row. I used the row, GoPro row, <laughs> and got it to connect properly. Yeah. I don't think they updated their thing. I think you have to follow the proper protocol. You just need to read instructions. No, no, but I did that <laughs> last week and it didn't work. Yeah, it's So weird. I used the same code that worked last time, or didn't work last time, that I set last week. All of a sudden decided it wanted to work this week and connect. This seems to be the standard intro to the show. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully this is it because so yeah. what you do is you open up the app. Mm -hmm. You hit connect. It says then click on the side button until it lights up blue because then it blinks in Wi-Fi. Then, and then, you go into settings and you go into your Wi-Fi. You select the camera. Boom. Then you go back into the GoPro app. It should connect. And you should type, while well, you type in the password, you should be good to go. So it worked and I didn't break it and I didn't throw it out. Good. Yet. But it works really well. Yeah. When it works. When it works. When it works properly. But it's up there. It's still ticking. And it's blinking. And still taking 128 gig cards, too. All right. We ready to go? Yeah. Let's get this one started. Let's do it. Jared Poland, Frono's Photo. Dot com. Welcome to episode Raw Talk, episode number 138. This week, we have an interview with Danny Clinch. Yes. We went up to New York City to go to his uh, studio mm -hmm. to sit down and have a discussion before he went to Bonnaroo. And this is something that I've been trying to do for years. Since before Frono's photo, I've been emailing his assistant or whoever is his uh, studio manager mm -hmm. for trying to spend the day with him, become an assistant, or do something. And it never worked out. Um, and now it, it, it worked out, was able to make it work. It was great. Uh, so we're going to have that coming up uh, a little later, and we're going to have an intro to that so that we can lead into that interview, which was, what was it about? It was a, it was a lengthy interview compared to most of our interviews. And I had I about say. two minutes of talking. Yeah. Roughly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was it. But that's yeah, good. You, you I like to just talked. sit there and be quiet. Yeah, just so, listen. So this is how this one's going to work because that was a long episode. We've got uh, 10 photo news stories coming up. Mm -hmm. We've got the Danny Clinch interview. We've got the Wheel of Fro. We've got a Pluggy McPluggerson. And then we've got the wrap it up and wrap it up. The wrap it up. And that's over. Yeah. But it's not over yet. All right. Not we yet. got Sutter here. Sutter, what's going on? Hey guys, um, so this is my last Raw Talk. I know, all the tears are being shed out there. Um, yeah, I, I've just been with my trip coming up and you know, all my photo work, I'm getting busier and busier every day and you know, I can't balance that and, and Raw Talk, so I'm gonna have to uh, sneak out of here. All right, so Sutter's gonna sneak out soon, not yet. Uh, we really appreciate having you for as oh, yeah. long as we've had. Yeah, it's been cool to watch as you've gone from somebody without a microphone <laughs> to somebody with a microphone, uh, and then Inspector Dale Cooper, yes, or Doctor Dale Cooper, <laughs> or Special Agent Dale Cooper. Which I tried watching the first episode of Twin Peaks. Did you? I pff, screw that. Nothing. <laughs> I couldn't do that. It was too. I'm like, this is too slow. It has a slow start. I'm for like, sure. I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. Orange is the new black is coming on. I will watch that. I've heard good things about the new season of that. Yeah. they. Do, I, I was like, I'm not waiting till midnight to watch, so I'll just watch tomorrow. And then I went on and they started at six hours early. Oh, really? They did because there was it, it corresponded with the con. Orange is the new black con. You know, like everything's a con, Comic -Con comic book con, and, yeah. you know, brony con. <laughs> do you know what brony con is? No. Bronies. Bronies? My Little Pony. Men Who Like My Little Pony. No way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and don't you remember oh at AVN God. what happened? No, what you happened? You don't remember at AVN uh -uh. when they had My Little Pony Tales? I did not see that. Butt plugs? Oh, my God. <laughs> you don't remember did that? Did I see that? And they had high heels with dildos on the back of them. Ah, great. <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> I digress. I go the wrong way. Um, uh, so yeah. that, I guess, I guess that that's it, eh? Yeah, I guess so. Well, thank you, son. All right, we'll have Appreciate fun it. on Thanks the trip. Again, guys. Yeah, um, I'll keep you guys updated on yeah. that. Yeah, Good we luck can with everything. show up, send postcards digitally. We can <laughs> be like, this is, this is where he's at now. Sure. Tracking. So. All right, well, cool. thanks again, guys, and thank you, everyone out there who's uh, emailed me, you know, messaged me on Facebook. It was great, you know, conversating with everybody. Uh, I've had a blast, and I'm not dying, so, I mean, you guys can still <laughs> email me or whatever if you do have questions, but uh, thanks again, guys. I'll, uh, I'll get out of your hair. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Sutter. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. All right, see ya. Take care, buddy.
Oh, we got to do photo. Oh, I got to do a Pluggy McPluggerson in a second. Yeah. So why don't we do the Pluggy McPluggerson? Let's do it. Let's let's do the Pluggy. Video blocks, audio blocks, graphics stock. Yes. Part of the reason that we've been able to do some of the things that we've been able to do lately has been because of their support. And not only do they help us because they did an article. They just got more funding. And Joel, right? Joel, Mm -hmm. who's the founder, cited us our show as uh, as part of the reason or a, a new direction they're going with like advertising or or trying to reach more people because mm-hmm. they used to do just like email list email list email list and now it's like they want to talk to social influencers which is what Squarespace has been doing all along yeah they do the social influencer thing and this has been very good for them and it's been very good for us he cited that we've been using it since before they worked with us and he's like it's the perfect partnership yeah because we already used it they want to reach the people that I mean we have targeted people because if you're a video if you're getting into any type of video or you do photos and you do music with them you can't go wrong with audio blocks if you do anything related to posting video online or audio online where you need extra stuff you need to use audio blocks there's no there's there's free stuff out there but it's a lot harder to find and it's typically not quality free stuff It's typically not quality and you don't really have the rights to use it yeah that's what it comes down to is the rights and so you have royalty free music on audioblocks.com audioblocks.com slash go slash fro (laughs) if you want to try out your free trial um we use it each week to get the 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 marching music last week. Yep, which did, is what did we listen? did. I did listen to that. You know, I I love it was listening some, to some the, epic war music. Right, and and I and will ambiance. be doing a contest soon because we're going to be going down to their their office at the end of this month already. So in almost two weeks from when we're recording this, we're well, there's only going to be a certain number of fro guests that can be there because it's a smaller environment. But we're going to do an interview with Joel, and we're going to do a lot a, a a mobile raw talk from their office and. We will have guests there. So there will be more information on that as well as contests that will be running for audio blocks. Uh, Video blocks is another thing that we've used tremendously to cut in Mm B-roll and glue. So you can go to audio blocks, sorry, videoblocks.com slash go slash fro. And then graphic stock, to be honest with you, I don't know that much about because we haven't... We haven't dived into that just yet, I feel Dived like. into it, yeah. right? It's dived is <laughs> dived. the word. But from what they say, graphic stock is a place that if you need images to pop up on the screen or images for just about anything, it's royalty-free images. Yeah. You, you can't go wrong with that. And, and also, they have backgrounds for videos. Like Todd uses backgrounds. He's always asking us for backgrounds, right? Static backgrounds, yeah. More, more for placing your picture when you do like a five-minute portrait Which type he thing. did in the Vegas five-minute he portrait. He, he used, used, I think, like a... A poker table. Exactly. Should have used my poker table. Should have. Damn it. Todd. <laughs> Screwed up, Todd. Again graphicstock.com slash go slash fro so all i have to say is they've been extremely supportive of us they help us do the certain content that we want to do and keep pursuing it and we use it and you can't go wrong when you just use it yeah so there's that um the chair's empty now it is so we're gonna try and fill it we're not sure who we're gonna fill it with yet but there's always Dale people Cooper. that want to come on the show. Dale Cooper? Mm-hmm. No, he, he left too. Oh. So there's no Dale Cooper. Damn it. He, what's he going to sit there and be like, meh, 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 meh. You got to put the microphone all the way down. It'd be like get no, a, get tiny a, mini, a tiny road microphone and it just sit there going, <laughs> meh, 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 macro meh, lens. Meh, meh, meh. But if, if you're interested and you're local and you want to fill this chair, possibly message me on the Facebook fan page. What is local considered? Local means you're within a half an hour to an hour of this area because what we would basically be looking for and we have some people in mind already would be to help reset the cameras yeah. maybe not be on air because you got to earn the right to be on air Sutter did yeah yeah you got to earn it so that would be just helping with the cameras and moving the wheel of fro and learning quite a bit because there's a lot that you can learn help me set up of how of how well yes there's that there's the business side of it which is all behind the scenes stuff but you get you get a look at things a little different because you get in to not just seeing the show but you get to be a part of you it you get in so send the messages over there only on the Facebook, not my personal Facebook, but the Frono's Photo Facebook. Good? Good. All right. I am watching the clock because that's my job okay. this week. And it's your turn to get into photo news. But before you do that, we've got to get some audio blocks music from oh, audioblocks.com. I almost slash forgot this week. Fro. You almost forgot. I did. Should we do some farewell music? Farewell music. Okay. Is that kind of sad music? Well, usually or is farewell it like music. triumphant music? 
I mean, you find a, I, the I, best I'm, choice. Either I'm sure fa- I'll find something good. Either farewell, which is. I think we're on the side. <laughs> Not that kind of farewell. Oh, bagpipes. Get me bagpipes. But that feel like that represents death half the time. Get me bagpipes. <laughs> okay. Or bagpipes that are happy. Okay. Bagpipes. Freedom! <laughs> Ready? And, right, and bagpipes. That's me playing a bagpipe. There's your audio blocks, the audio. They get me every time. Let's Those bad get types. into your photo news. So a Russian photographer named Ralph Marebs released... That, how, is the, how is Ralph Russian? I don't, I don't know. It's his name. Ralph Lusky. Released a set of images from what's left of the Soviet space shuttle program. Now the urban explorer got a first-hand look inside the... Baikonur Cosmodrome, a uh, giant abandoned hangar that housed old space shuttles. Now he took photos of inside the 200-foot-tall building, capturing detailed images of what's left of the ruins, including two Buran space shuttles, with one being nearly ready for flight and the other being a full-size mock-up that was being used for testing. Do, now, do you know where do you know where they got the the space shuttle from? Where they have our schematics. Do they? Oh yeah. Because what happened is they got the design schematics for the shuttle and then built one themselves. And I think they only flew one test flight, if my History Channel knowledge is right, that they only flew one test flight and they never actually were able to use it. Well, that's what they said. Yeah, one test flight. Now, oh, really? Yeah, I believe I, right. I believe they did say that. Um, All right. As far as background info goes, though, the Brand Space Shuttle program was in operation for about 19 years, they said, from 1974 to 93. Well, that is a complete failure if it took you 19 years to never get off the ground. Before the whole project was canceled due to lack of funding when the Soviet Union collapsed. Now, I'm just amazed that there's like no tagging in the hangar. There's no graffiti anywhere. Mr. Gorbachev, <laughs> tear down, down the- this wall. Um, Where did I leave my cupcakes? Because I'm certainly hungry. I mean, this thing must have been pretty sealed up for years. For It, it looked like it was almost untouched. Area. Yeah, yeah or a very secluded area. So you can see all the photo news stories and more over at fronosphoto.com slash rawtalk hyphen 138. Yes. Joe McNally teamed up with Nikon to offer free wedding portraits to New York City couples via the Nikon wedding truck. Uh, here's what happened. They brought a truck into New York City and parked it in front of City Hall. Now, any couple who brought their certificate of marriage dated between June 1st to 5th, 2015, received free portraits with uh, from Joe. Now, the truck featured a portable pop-up studio in the back of it, uh, complete with a backdrop. John Lemon, a New York, New York City photographer, was a paid photographer hired by one of the couples to take their photos that day. Now, he explained the whole process of how the truck worked. He says, in quotes, I met up with... My couple outside the marriage bureau as they got out of their cab and they were quickly approached by a Nikon person to see if they wanted to participate in the wedding truck photos. Can I be the Nikon person? <laughs> sure. Da, hello. Hello. Oh, I'm so glad we got married. Would you? Ho- hello. Oh, hi. 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 Excuse me. It's I work for... the day of my life. I wor- stop it talking. I work I for... Ni- so happy. I, sh- I said stop it. I work for Nikon USA. <laughs> Would you... We have, a, we have a truck. We have a truck over here. Food and- truck? It, no, I'm shut up. Hungry. Shut up or I'll get angry. <laughs> we have a truck over here. It's big and yellow. And apparently we got a photographer <laughs> over here. It's going to take your wedding picture. <laughs> nah, just, uh, you just went from a kid <laughs> to like a, a southern person. Uh, yeah. Okay. We'll take your picture, please. Right over here on tree. <laughs> tree fitty. Now, since they had to wait for a friend to arrive anyway, we hopped over and started the process. They had a makeup station set up in case it was needed, but we skipped out. We skipped so yeah, that. in case you're ugly, you've got makeup. <laughs> we skipped that and we're scooted right over to Joe. Turns out they, they were his first couple of the project. Whoa. After a few minutes shooting with Joe, they sat down for a quick interview to share their love story. We then went into the marriage bureau to get married, and when we came out 30 you know minutes later, their wedding song was? a USB drive was waiting for them with final images, end quote. You know what they're, because love? I love you. Barney? You love me. Let's We're get a together happy and family with a knickknack paddy whack. Give the dog a bone. <laughs> this old man came roaming home. But you guys can find my, a link. What? My favorite thing is I was at improv one night that Todd was doing it. And I don't know if it was his improv group or another improv group, group but they had like this bar- Barney was a serial killer. And he's like, hello, kids. 
Oh, it's good. Improv is nasty. Does he dirty. still put up all all the? I don't videos know if on he YouTube? still shoots them. Probably not. He still does it each week, right? Uh, no, no, no. That was just for their little residency uh, that they okay. had. Maybe he just did it for that time period. I'm not sure. Um, but you guys can find all the links to the portraits over on the website, complete with some behind the scenes image from uh, John Lemon himself, not Lennon, John Lemon. Uh, photographer Brian Murr warns the community to watch out for fake memory cards on eBay. The photographer recently bought a 64 gig Transcend SD card from eBay. You know, I, I mean, equal opportunity these days, Transcend cards. I mean, it's all right. They go both ways. <laughs> and by the way, I'm going to interrupt you because if, uh, if you guys see any sort of shaking going on, yes. they are in the midst of knocking down a bridge of I-95. It's probably outside. about 100 feet away, maybe? Uh, it's a little more than 100 feet. It's probably about 50 yards. Okay. Yeah, you know, a half a football field away from my window is a industrial sized jackhammer. And so we hear it and like a split second later you feel it's like the vibration. Shock, yeah. Can you feel it? Feel Can you it, feel, feel it? it? Can you feel the vibration? <laughs> Good vibrations. It's like a <laughs> sweet sensation. Feel it, feel it, feel it. All right, you do that. I'm going to reset the clock. Sounds good. Uh, now, the photographer recently bought a 64 gig Transcend SD card from eBay, like I said, realizing something was up after the first time he used it, it got corrupted. Now, after the card got corrupted, he examined the card and compared it to a legit Transcend card that he bought from B&H and noticed a couple big differences. Uh, one, the fake card was black, where the true card is blue. Two, the gradients and rainbow colors used in the real card are slightly different, along with the font type being off, and there's no drop, drop shadow in the capacity numbers. And three, the real card has a serial number on the back along with the stamp saying it was made in Taiwan and the fake card is just blank. Um, he then contacted Transcend directly through eBay. The company replied saying that he needs to, to try to get an exchange from the reseller he purchased from. Also, if the card isn't a genuine card, that Transcend can't do anything oh, about of course. it. It makes sense. Now, the eBay seller he bought it from uh, is named Discount Memory Sticks and he has 68 reviews with a 97.7% positive user feedback. Um, he sent the, sell the seller a message about the fake cards, and the seller responded with, in quotes, this is not a knockoff card. This is a Transcend 64 gigabyte memory card. If your camera doesn't work with it, just simply send it back and I'll refund you. But don't make accusation without proof, my friend. I am also a photographer and use many memory cards, including this one. Not all memory cards have a serial number on it. I understand you messed up and bought the wrong card for your camera and don't want to pay for the return shipping, so you're making wild accusation and trying oh, to Jesus. intimidate people Jesus just Christ. send back the card on my dime and get a life this is did he really say all that he did um, he then sent another message saying another thing it's hard to get knockoffs when I order these cards right from the transcend company know your facts before you start accusations when you send the card back to me it better be the exact same card that oh, was sent Jesus to you Christ, if not dude. I will be opening a case with PayPal because buying something and replacing it with damaged old or fake items are a All thief right, of services shut up already. and it's against the law my friend Jesus dude's God. being a hypocrite pretty much Jesus what do you, it's like you know what? I deal with customer service. Yeah. I, it's my job you personally deal to with deal it, yeah. with customer service here uh, on the beginner guides and yep. whatever guide that anybody purchases. And sometimes you get messages that you sit there and you're like, you're not, you're not going to win. So you just acquiesce calmly and usually yell when you can yell it at them <laughs> in front of the computer and stuff but don't do don't you don't do what this guy did all right it keeps going doesn't it well that's it that's it for for that story no that keeps going there was more on that story while you were driving over oh well that's the story that i have so far so on petapixel they talked to this guy okay this the the seller and what he say the seller said that he called his, they they caught the seller in like a using the wrong words he says he bought direct from Transcend. When he didn't, he bought through a wholesaler. Interesting. So the wholesaler that he bought from was selling counterfeit cards. So he was unaware of the fact that he was getting counterfeit cards. Gotcha. Because they were saying, and it was a. It, it, so in the research that I guess Michael Zhang did from, from Petapixel, okay. he found that the reseller was selling the counterfeit cards, was part of an Alibaba company in China who were obviously making counterfeit cards and selling them to this guy, and he thought they were real and turning around and sell it. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't make up for the fact that he was a dick, yeah. allegedly. In that response. No, wait. In my opinion, he was a dick in that response. Yep. Not allegedly. In my opinion. 
but that's that. So I, yeah, um, and I do want to note too that like there's a lot of these times, a lot of the times when these stories get updated on as I'm like traveling yeah. here or, or as just, we're setting up. And obviously, these these raw talks come out a couple of days later. So I usually try and update the posts, the article themselves yeah. on the website, just so all the information is there. Although the video might not have everything, but so here, I'm here, glad you updated me. Here's on some that. words of advice: buy cards yeah. from the reputable stores. Especially whether it's they're an, so cheap these days. Well, yeah, whether it's an Allen's, whether it's a B and H, whether it's an Adorama Picks, whether it's a Amazon sold by Amazon. Correct. Make sure it's sold by Amazon. Fulfilled by Amazon. Right. Well, fulfilled by is... Is that different? That means that it's fulfilled by Amazon, meaning I could send them product and they could house it for me and they fulfill it. Mm. So you just want to be very careful. Go to a reputable place. I, we, we know that B&H does sales all the time, especially with the Lexar stuff, and so does Adorama Picks. You can go there. You can find your cards. They're not that expensive. If you're trying to save money on your memory card, you should... If you're trying to save memory, money on your memory card... Take a minute, take your glasses off if you're wearing glasses, and punch yourself in the face. Because that way, you'll remind yourself not to think that you're saving money when you're actually being not very smart because you'll lose that data, possibly. Don't buy counterfeit cards. Yeah. Don't take a risk with your memory. Oh, that was lame. <laughs> Don't I, take a risk with your memory card. Like I could see a couple of years ago uh, them being... Yeah, a big price difference when you're buying them on eBay still something wouldn't like this. Do it, but my now with SD cards at least they're so inexpensive. CF cards are still a little pricey for a decent card, but uh, C- SD cards are just so cheap these days. Well, even compact flash cards are cheap as hell. They are still they're cheaper than they were. The 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 Lexar ones. But I still ones, don't think they're as affordable as SD cards are these days. So Lexar, we asked them to send us those 64 gig cards yep. for the trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, did we ask for we asked for compact flash? Mm-hmm. Both. Those were like ninety nine dollar cards yep. for the super fast ones. So. You, that's 64 gigs. Mm-hmm. So just think about that for 32 gigs, how much those are. Yep. Like 40 bucks for fast cards. So inexpensive. Don't cheap out on cards, please. No matter what it is. And, and that's it. Uh, let's see. DJI has a new experimental drone that's developer-friendly called the Matrice 100, or simply the M100. The new quadcopter was made specifically for developers to help them test new sensors, processors, and create original aerial applications in general. Now, the drone will fly for 20 minutes with a 2.2-pound payload. DJI says it includes Wait every- Wait a second. That's one kilo, right? <laughs> that's D- like dr- you could do a kilo of cocaine. There you go. Right over the border. Uh, DJ says it includes everything needed to to fly with minimal assembly and no need for tuning or programming. Uh, it also sports dual battery compartments, which can boost flight time up to 40 minutes Damn. if two batteries are used. Uh, expansion bays to add components, and it has universal power ports and a lighter frame in general. Uh, they also announced a new collision avoidance system called Guidance, which they're calling the first commercially available collision avoidance for aerial platforms. Uh, it uses stereo cameras and ultrasonic sensors. Uh, and the system can detect objects anywhere around a UAV within 65 feet or stabilize it with centimeter accuracy above the ground. Now, DJI adds that the Matrice 100 is always aware of its surroundings and will automatically adjust its flight path path when closing in on objects or obstructions, a.k.a. Skynet. Uh, The M100 will run developers about 3,300 bucks, and the guidance system will be sold for about $1,000. Oh, Jesus. Do you know what's interesting? What? My buddy uh, Bill Rogers yeah. was telling me that he picked up this drone that was like 900 and some dollars plus 300 and some dollars for the gimbal for the GoPro. Okay. And it's more of like an open source drone system. And it's got... So it's not a DJI. No, it's not a DJI. It was another company that I need to look up. There's so many now. But he, but he was telling me that it had some awesome features that I wish the Phantom had. Really? He said there was like a cable cam feature. Like... Uh, makes it seem like a cable cam. So you you program it, you put it where you want it to start, okay. you fly it to where you want it to end, and you hit a button. And so what it does is it will go back and forth on that path nonstop. That's cool. And then there's the other where you can have it do a flyaway, where you set it to fly away from here, and then it does a flyaway. Where you could set it to do a 360, where it just goes around. You can uh, The DJIs need to have these automated buttons. Yeah. Like, hit this button to do X, and hit this button to do Y. That's what they need. And he said it's pretty accurate? He said, uh, he said from everything that he's read, they just got one. Oh, he didn't actually use it yet. No, but it, it, it's, it's, it's more open source. Gotcha. 
Okay. And it's possible that maybe that's what the GoPro version will end up doing. Now, for the M100, pre-orders are now open with both devices set to ship at the end of this month. And there is a preview video of the M100 and guidance in action. It's over on the website for you guys to check out. Fronosphoto.com slash rawtalk-138. A couple more stories. 500 picks blocked user Nico Tavernese's account after he began uploading an amazing collection of images uh, from movie sets, which the company assumed were not his blocking him in return. Now, 500 Picks says the photos were so good, they automatically thought that they were fake. Oh, gee, I mean, I mean, God forbid we <laughs> they, see photos that are so good. good. I mean, they can't be fake. his. Oh, no, they can't be his. They're too good. Now, they say, when our customer excellence team stumbled across an account that consisted entirely of movie scenes and movie posters, they assumed it was fake, deleted all the photos, and sent a warning. I mean, who on 500 Picks could possibly have photos from the set of Spider-Man on their account? Oh, gee darn, who? Uh, this Nick- guy. Nico. Now, Nico is a set photographer, filmmaker, editor, and much more, with his portfolio being packed full of behind the scenes and official photos from movies like Black Swan, The Amazing Spider Man 2, uh, Noah, The Wrestler, and much more. I'm sure we've seen a lot of this stuff for like the actual promotion purposes yeah. of the movies, like the Spider Man poster is his picture. Uh, a lot of the movie posters in general are his photos. Yep. So that's why they thought that it wasn't his. Yep. Now, on the topic of 500 picks, along with other portfolio sites, a new website called Terms of Service Didn't Read. Toss. <laughs> Tosser is aiming to help spell out the legal mumbo jumbo of the terms and conditions you're agreeing to on these sites in simpler terms. Now, the site says, I have read and agreed to the terms is the biggest lie on the web. We aim to fix that. They add that terms of services are often too long to read, but it's important to understand what's in them. I got to interrupt you. What's up? Funny thing just happened. What happened? My watch just tinged. It's from Bill Rogers, who showed me, who just sent me a picture of his new drone. Without you even asking for it? No. Wow. It just tinged, and it was like perfect timing. Let me let me hold it up to the if camera. If only that was about five minutes ago, but still. well, wait, close enough, no, yeah, close man. Enough, yeah. So I'm gonna. Can I hold it up? Yeah, sure. I'll hold it up. Maybe you've seen this thing before. Is it? Is that the? Uh is that the halo or something it's called? No, I'm going to ask him what it's called right now. You can keep going, but... It's, it's all black, and it, yeah, it, looks, it looks more like futuristic, cool. kind of. Yeah. Uh, let's see. But <laughs> how ironic is that? That is funny. Don't you think? Yeah, don't it's you think? It's like... <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, they say it's important to understand what's in them. Your rights online depend on them. We hope that our ratings can help you get informed about your rights. Yeah, I don't want to read their service. I don't want to read their website either. Now, what they do is they list grades from a class A in green, meaning good terms that benefit the user, to class E in red, meaning poor terms that benefit the company. Now, users can simply visit the website and click on the service to see the rating, or they can install the browser add-on and view it directly in browser. So far, they have websites listed like YouTube, which is actually a class D, uh, uh, SoundCloud, 500 Picks, Facebook, Flickr, Instagram, there's a whole bunch of other social media websites. But basically, you just click on the actual website, it top, drops down the list, tells you the rating, and then kind of simplifies all the terms. I actually terms. like that. That sounds yeah. good. It's nice when we had that whole uh, issue with YouTube when they changed their terms. We should have, hopefully, this. Yeah, no, we that wish sounds that good. this website would have existed. That's cool. Then. It's like a rating system for their terms of services. Exactly. They could probably point out the things that they don't like and that you need to watch out for, and then go, eh. So are you not going to go onto YouTube that has a billion people looking just yeah. because of X? And they're, they're still uploading or updating the website, I should say. Um, they, so they still haven't exactly classified each website just yet. They only have a couple, but the rating system is being adjusted Got and it. constantly updated. Um, but I wanted to bring this up uh, since people are always confused about copyright. I mean, this <laughs> site pretty much spells it out for you. <laughs> We have a photographer and his model were seriously injured after an explosion occurred in the car they were shooting in. Now, photographer Helmut Montoya and his model were in a junkyard in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They were in an old beat-up car during a photo shoot when they decided to add candles as props to help the ambiance of the image. Now, did they have permission to be there? They did. They did. Uh, Without warning, the car exploded, engulfing the model in two to three foot high flames. Now the photographer then tried to rescue the model, putting, uh, pulling her out and using his own body to put out the flames, which in turn made him suffer burns on his hands and face. They were then transported to the burn unit at Jackson Memorial Hospital. However, it was too late for her, not that she died, but she suffered much worse burns that doctors say are life-threatening. Uh, with burns on 75% of her body. Witnesses say she was completely covered in flames, with one witness saying the fire burnt all her hair, clothes, and shoes off. Oh, jeez. Now, investigators believe gas fumes may have been ignited, causing the explosion. So hopefully they're okay. Moral of the story for this, well, know what you're doing, 
Uh, they did have permission. They did, yeah, from the S- junkyard insurance manager, owner waivers. Guy. If you're going to be shooting somewhere, this is why a place gets insurance waivers. Yep. So if the junkyard didn't get an insurance waiver or something, somebody may decide to sue them. Yep. Now there's also uh, a- apparently there was like a big tarp around that area, and I guess that's what kept the fumes in oh. that section. So that's why it just lit up everywhere. By the way, the uh, the drone was called a 3DR Solo. Ah, 3DR Solo. I don't know if we've talked about that one. Or I don't know. if I've even heard about it. We'll have to look it up ourselves. Yeah. Chief photographer Joel Markland of the Swedish photo agency Bildbaran? Beep, 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 beaker. Probably got that wrong, but... Beaker. They released a day-in-the-life type video of him covering a huge soccer event. He recently photographed the 2015 UEFA Champions League final. UEFA. UEFA. Something like that. uh, In Berlin and documented the whole thing. He used the GoPro to showcase the the behind-the-scenes of his busy day, from the second his alarm went off to catch his 4 a.m. flight to the actual soccer game to uh, uploading the images to finally getting to a car uh, to leave Berlin the next morning. Now, in the video, you see him with two cameras on at all times uh, and him setting up a remote camera at the goalpost as well. He pops up images like as he's shooting towards the end of the video. Pretty cool. Great shots. Um, makes you realize just how crazy it is to film like an event like this. Yeah. But it is a cool little behind the scenes like four minute video of just what goes on in this busy busy life nice yeah uh, a new keyboard has been announced called sonder which promotes the use of in-program shortcuts by using e-ink with every application having different shortcuts making it nearly impossible to remember them all this keyboard aims to help you with not having to remember any of them now the customizable keyboard features an e-ink display on each of the main keys that can be customized with different icons for different programs so for example when you're using Lightroom you can have the shortcut icon on each key reflect that particular tool or feature that key is used for while editing your photos in that specific program then if you switch into Photoshop or for like a more heavy duty heavy duty edit Editing, the keyboard will adjust the keys to that program's shortcuts. Does that make sense? I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> now, 50 of the 78 keys I mean, on the I Bluetooth was, keyboard yeah. can be customized and are lit up in the dark, which is pretty good. Uh, the keys can also be changed for different lag- language settings and general key layouts. How much is it? Uh, you can pre-order it now for $199. How big is it? It's about the size of a normal Mac keyboard, normal Mac Bluetooth keyboard. So, it, Ugh, so I don't small. know exact s- dimensions, but it looks to be about... I would say laptop I would venture size. to say that the keys, though, are much thicker. They they look a little thicker as far as, like, they pop out more, but they don't really look much bigger. I mean, it, 200 bucks is isn't bad. Now, I hope you don't have to buy, like, the keyboard shortcuts and stuff. No, no, you shouldn't like, have to. Or you could just get a keyboard cover. You could get a keyboard cover, but then you have to change it for each program. Sure. This one will automatically do it. Yeah, that's thirty four ninety nine. Oh, it's going to be obviously much more exp- yeah. expensive. Uh, it's more geared towards Mac users, though, again, because it's uh, it's the keyboard looking like an Apple keyboard. Yes. Um, but it will work for PC users as well. Now, fans who are interested in the keyboard can pre-order it now, but they are reportedly planning to launch a Kickstarter later this year to officially release it. And we've got one more story this week. We've got the International Air Transport Association, or the IATA, I-A-T-A. They unveiled a new size guideline this week for domestic U.S. flights that proposed a 21% size reduction in max carry-on size allowed. This means that the beloved think tank airport security bag may seem soon be too big uh, to carry onto your flight, which sucks for us. Oh, that would be bullshit, but keep going. I'll keep going. The press release states that working with airline members of IATA and aircraft manufacturers, an optimum, optimum size guideline for carry-on bags has been agreed that will make the best use of cabin st- space storage. A size of 55 by 35 by 20 centimeters uh, means that theoretically everyone should have a chance to store their carry-on bags on board aircraft of of 120 seats or larger. An IAT Cabin OK logo to signify to airline staff that a bag meets the agreed size guidelines has been developed. Yeah, I'll put that on my bag and you... A number of major international airlines have uh, signaled their interest to join the initiative and will soon be introducing the guidelines into their operations. Now, Tom Windmuller, IATA Senior Vice President for Airport, Passenger, Cargo, and Security, says, in quotes, the development of an agreed optimal cabin bag size will bring common sense and order to the problem of differing sizes for carry-on bags. Didn't they have, don't they have one of these already? I thought they do, but I guess they're just trying to make it smaller. We know 
the current situation can be frustrating for passengers, this work will help to iron out inconsistencies and lead to an improved no, you passenger know what's frustrating? experience. You know what's frustrating, End Stephen? Quote. What? What's frustrating is when the people that try to get on the plane with a bag that is clearly the size of a freaking truck way too big and think that they're going to be able to get it up and then look at you all like, oh, I thought it would fit. Well, I don't understand what's going on over here. I mean, it really comes down to if they just handle the bags better in general, we wouldn't even have this issue to or fear that they're going to ruin our bags if well, we check them. But there's certain we things like have to bring them on. It, it, I don't. It doesn't. Honestly, it, knock on some wood. It hasn't taken that much longer to get your bags at certain airports. Philly, it takes a little longer to get your bags because that's go around that whole freaking airport to get you your bags when you're waiting for it. Or I would have been out the door and home already. Yeah. But you know, for us to carry on, a, it fits like it fits. And and there was also a new development for the new, a new type of uh, overhead compartment that is the same size, but designed differently so that you can stand up and get more bags in it than what you currently can at the current size. Like, I have no problem. If it's a standard, it's a standard. Yeah. But enforce the standard. You know, the airport security was made in with in mind for the standard to to fit the standard for the United for flying in the U.S. Yes, it's not t technically too big to fly in international, depending on the planes. But that's what the airport international is for. for. But the airport security, we can put our life in that thing. Everything. And if you shrink it, we're gonna have to reevaluate. Which means now we need to take two of those bags yep. and take up more space up top. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. we don't take up that much space no. the other way around. No. So, look, a standard's a standard. But don't get me started on the flight industry, especially the TSA, who missed all of those <laughs> 73 out of 77 bomb, fake bombs got through recently. Oh, yeah, I heard and about that. Then, and then more recently, the news that the TSA had illegal immigrants working for them and people that didn't have social security numbers or missing numbers and missing addresses. Really? And How's that possible? Uh, I think there was like 100 or 90 or some so people, if my memory serves me correct, that were on the terrorist watch list that are working for the TSA. So I don't understand how that that can work, how you can be on the terrorist watch list and work for the TSA because either you can tell them that you aren't on, you should, you're not a terrorist and they prove that and they take you off the freaking list and you have a job. How do you fail that bad? Now, it's not every TSA person. We've run into good and we've run into incompetent. There seems to be far more incompetent TSA workers all the way up and down the pipe than the other way around. It's just very frustrating. It is. It is. Because it's a false sense of security that we've talked about before. They're not... You don't feel safer because the TSA is there. You just feel like, well, this is just BS. Now, the IATA is just a trade association and not a government agency. So this proposed oh. regulation is not a requirement for airlines to follow just yet. Uh, however, eight international airlines have already adopted the size guideline, including Air China, uh, China Southern, uh, Qatar, and a bunch more. Now, according to the Washington Post, airlines like American and Delta uh, have not expressed uh, that they will adopt the new policy suggestion anytime soon. All right. So US hopefully Air. the U.S. will not adopt this whole guideline. Uh, and that is it for Photo News this week. A little light on news um, because I am going on a trip. Very yeah, soon. where you going? And Tell we're people. recording this early, so I'm going to Firefly Music Festival. Actually, by the time this comes out, I will be getting home probably. Yeah, or at least leaving the festival that night. So Sunday is this like night. a vacation you're taking? Kind of. I'm going from Wednesday to Monday morning slash afternoon. Uh, we're camping out. It's going to be five days of camping, something like that, five and a half. Um, but yeah, I, I, this past week I've been prepping and buying a ton of stuff. I've spent so much money on Amazon with, in, with tents, coolers, camelbacks, all kinds of crap. Camelbacks. Yeah. You must have a nice boss. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, this is also the first like yeah. vacation that I'm taking off. So we yeah. had to record raw talk a little early this week being Monday versus in normally being Thursday. Thursday so, but it, it's worked because we had the interview from last week. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, but yeah, that's just and what happens. The interview leads in perfectly too, because he is a music photographer and he just did Bonnaroo. And right. Yeah. He just went to Bonnaroo. So, uh, I'll miss you. <laughs> I'll miss you too. I mean, who who will I have to talk to now <laughs> when I'm in my own dungeon? I can't even talk to you. I mean, you can try and call me, but I probably won't hear it because I'll be, be jamming like, out. I'll be like, Steven. <laughs> Steven, nothing. I just wanted to hear your voice. I just, I just want to hear your voicemail. 
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> speaking of music festivals, Danny Clinch is one of the more well-known photographers in the music world and advertising world over the past, I would say, 20-some years. About 20 years. Oh, yeah. Or maybe it's even more than more 20 at years. at this point, I think, Because yeah. it's 2015. That makes it 05, that 95. More like 25 years. Yeah, so into the early 90s. Uh, he has assisted some of the most well-known photographers in the world, like Annie Leibovitz, uh, Terry White, a bunch of other people. And he... You know, I love listen to this story that he tells about how he became an assistant for Annie Leibovitz. It's one of those things like you're going to sit there and be like, well, that could have been me. Well, yeah, it could have been yep. you. But wait till you hear that story. And this is one of the I love interviews where I don't have to say very much. But that's the interviews. whole point. You ask a question, you shut your freaking mouth, and you listen to an answer, and you don't interrupt like I do to Steven. All it's the time. Just, but that's photo <laughs> news. It's a little different. It's whatever. Interviews, you let the person speak because it's about them, not about you. And exactly. when I say you, I mean me. <laughs> so we went up to New York last Tuesday to sit down with Danny Clinch. We talked about his new book right here called Still Moving. One of my favorite books that's on the shelf because it's it's well put together. Oh, yeah. There's a shizer ton uh, of images in here. And you can find it. They told me that you can go to dannyclinch.com or more exactly dannyclinch.bigcartel.com, which is where you can get this for 50 bucks and it comes signed. If really? you don't, if you want to get it on Amazon, you can still get it on Amazon. It doesn't come but signed. signed. But if you buy direct from Danny on his website, you can get this book signed uh, and ma and mailed to you. Um, please allow two to three. Oh, I love weeks. it. He's got Eddie Vedder on the front, who's one of his good buddies. He's got the foreword by. Is that Tom Waits on the back? This is Tom Waits on yeah, the back. He's got the foreword by Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen. I mean, <laughs> look. If you ever watched right Almost there. Famous, it's like he's lived the Almost Famous life. Uh, his studio is beautiful. Oh, the, great his, studio. I love talking to his assistant Dan. Yeah. Just really talk about an assistant who's really busting his ass because he mm -hmm. wants it and just talking to him it was great because he's like look if there's certain jobs that come up that maybe danny can't do i get to do them i mean talk about you pay your dues you work your ass off you and danny assisting everybody unbelievable R fantastic interview i think you guys are going to really enjoy this so give it a listen it's a long interview yeah but it's 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 really really good really and good. really enjoyable so let's get to new york and that interview yeah. so you're going to tell me the story danny behind this table so my neighbor across the uh the hall was selling this table and i needed a table and i was like man this will be great and i saw it in his place it looked great and so my buddy gary and i went over there to get it and we went to pick it up and it's so heavy that you cannot even believe it and we didn't know how first of all how we were going to get it out the door and how the heck did they get it into this building first right. of all is what i wanted to know uh, but anyway, we, we took, I had an old um, longboard, a skateboard, really long, and we bought it over there, we leaned this over, we put it on the longboard, balanced it on there, and just rolled it across the hallway and jiggled it and jiggled it and jiggled it until it got into here. And it's not a bowling alley, although it does appear. It could, I mean, it could be. It could, I mean, it could, could be an old, it's not as, yeah, no. It shuffleboard, be good to hit that board. maybe. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Yeah. So you're getting ready to go to Bonnaroo tomorrow? Yeah. So thank you for taking the time to sit here and talk. I appreciate you having me. How many years have you been doing that? Uh, what, what year is this of Bonnaroo? Is it 15? 14. 14. Wow. So what, what is... 14 what, years. <laughs> what do you do? What is your role? Um, it's interesting. I started um, Jonathan Mayers, one of the Superfly guys. Um, I think he had seen the work that I did with um, the Beastie Boys for the concerts for a free Tibet that they had put on. And I did a book of photographs. And um, what had happened was my friend Shelby Mead invited me out to these concerts and said, in exchange for an all-access pass, would you share your photos with us for the cause? I said, absolutely. And I said to myself, I always wanted to do like a, a portrait, like a Irving Penn style, uh, world in a small room portrait area, natural light kind of thing. And I never thought, she would agree to it, but I asked anyway, and she said, sure, bring it on. So that was in like 96 or something, and I built my first natural light portrait tent at a festival. Um, and the lineup was amazing. Um, Foo Fighters, Beck, Sonic Youth, Bismarcky, 
you know, Tribe Called Quest. I mean, it was just like, it was an amazing, amazing bill. And then every year uh, after that, the four years they did it, I did these portraits. So Jonathan had seen the portraits and was they had started this festival uh, called Bonnaroo. And he invited me out to photograph and do a little portrait setup. So that was my first year. Um, the second year, he decided that um, he wanted to make a film about the festival, um, more a concert film. Uh, type of thing. And this is pre digital everything. So we shot the concert. uh, And we made um, a film called 280 miles to Graceland to it, it might be 280 miles from Graceland. (laughs) And we shot it all on film 16 millimeter super eight. It was kind of like my ode to uh, jazz on a summer day. Um, Very um, musical abstract uh you know segues in between the imagery no talking head interviews or anything like that um and so i did the portrait tent uh and i did this film uh and the same with the next couple of years i would do the portrait thing i would do the film uh and it grew into a certain sometimes it was like i do the portrait thing then i'd be creating content for uh something someone like fuse and i remember this one year i was doing uh, a portrait, my portrait thing, which I do every year. Um, I did some content for Fuse, I believe. And the band I play in, the Tangiers Blues Band, played the festival. Nice. So, so you were pretty busy. I was like, it was all came full circle. It was really, really fun. And we had a blast. And, um, and uh, I've done so much content. I've been doing the Super Jam uh, films for them for years. Uh, last year, we did uh, Skrillex. Mm. Um, with a great bunch of people, um, Janelle Monet and um, uh, um, Matt from Cage the Elephant, uh, uh, Robbie Krieger from The Doors, um, uh, 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 Damian Marley. Uh, it goes on and on. It was really, really deep and really, really fun. And before that was um, one with um, Jim James and Brittany from Alabama Shakes, uh, John. Um, from uh, Hall and Oates, uh, yeah. <laughs> John Oates, what a great guy! Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, as you uh, from from a musical perspective and a fan perspective, I'm a big music fan, and sometimes you kind of dismiss some of these folks who you've heard, like, oh yeah, you know, Hall and Oates, uh, you know, I'm sure he's a great guy and he's super super cool, and we met him and stuff, and. I mean, that guy is no joke. I mean, they're, you know, they're hauling oats for a reason, you know, <laughs> these yeah. people who have been around for years. Uh, it's kind of like the blues artists when the blues artists come around and, you know, they're still doing it in their 80s and they're still as authentic and as cool and as badass as always. And I, I, I think that people should respect that about music in any genre, you know, that people have grown and they've lived life and they're, you know, they're, you should learn from what they have to offer. Absolutely. So after 14 years of doing that, the Bonnaroo, um, how do you keep it fresh? How, what, what's your take on keeping something fresh? Yeah. Well, if you look through the years of Bonnaroo, um, it really started, I think, the first year. I may have had two flats put together in a V, and then I was like putting black fabric here and there and white bounce cards. It was all ambient light was yeah. the idea. And now it's grown to like 20 by 20 silks with um, flats on the side that you can pull back to open up light. Oh, I need a little more light here. Let's open this. Let's pull the front up for some fill, you know, and that sort of thing. And um, and a couple of years I've done a white on the back side of the portrait area. I've done a white thing with natural light white. And um, so Dan and I, um, it, you know, my assistant, were kicking ideas around for this year. And I, I saw something that was really inspiring to me. It was just a very simple portrait of someone that was lit um, from the top, very toppy light um, and a black background and just the simplicity of it and the light coming from that angle. So we're going to, we're splitting the, the area up into two this year. So it's going to be the black on black. It's going to be the, the black set where I bought, um, I painted chairs and tables black. And, um, and then there's going to be a white set. And I think for the first time 
ever I'm going to, I'm going to use a strobe for the white set. Like mm. I will have a certain idea of how I want it to look, how I want it lit. Uh, and the idea that I have for that, um, is interesting as well. And, um, so if you look through the years, you'll see, sometimes I painted the walls. I put the wallpaper up sometimes, sometimes it was white, sometimes it's gray, sometimes it's a wood floor, sometimes it was a backdrop. Yeah. And, uh, it doesn't stray too far from the simple idea of a portrait right. and, and the relationship and the moment that we can build together with the subject. Yeah. No, that's, that's cool. And it, yeah. before we started, you were showing me the kind of like the toy box, all the different styles of cameras. And, it, you know, I know over the years it has to get tough to you don't want to do the same thing over and over so it seems like you've been experimenting all along i have i've always been a fan of uh of of the document first of all i love the document i love danny lyon i love robert frank um you know and then there's avidon and Penn and the masters you know mary ellen mark yeah. uh, god bless her who i worked with also for a couple of months and um and I've also been a fan of really outside the box things that are more artful and, you know, and, and the thing that I feel really fortunate about as a photographer is that I've been doing commercial photography for years only with musicians. Right. So, and musicians, there's no rules in their mind, you know, and it's been such a great thing for me to be able to do the document in one respect which is, you know, simple. It's about the moment and the atmosphere and, and that sort of thing. But then to also take a camera like a, like a Diana, an old 50s plastic camera, and put it on bulb and do a triple exposure, you know, I started to dig through, like, what camera could I find? Oh, a half frame. Shoot a half frame in a way that, like, if you combine three of the frames, it becomes something interesting. Yeah. You know, shoot. Um, you know, sometimes I'm in a situation where, I'm in a hotel and I get like 20 minutes with someone in a hotel room and you go in there and you say, okay, well, I've got my ideas, my fallback ideas, and I'm going to go in there and see what happens. What does the artist have there that I could use for the photo shoot or what, um, what, what can I bring to the table with the cameras that I have? And sometimes you can be beating it up with like your Hasselblad and you're trying to get it and it's just, well, for whatever reason, it's not working. And you take your Holga and you do like, a triple exposure and it's kind of weird but at the end of the day it's like you're there to get one great image and it's a happy accident happens for sure. some reason or i take my wide lux and you know i put it on slow and do a little something or you know you get someone in the frame who doesn't think they're in the frame and you know for me i'm like i'm looking for a little surprise and a little discovery so the, and, um, it's all part of the game yeah i mean for you it's 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 that capturing that moment and it's just I mean, that is the fun for it. It is like a game for us to, to go out there, visualize, pre-visualize what you want to capture, and then the challenge of being put into... Because one of the questions I had written down, and I rarely look at my questions, by the way, is um, the mindset. Do you get into a different mindset when you're shooting? You know, Because there's, there's the times where you're just joking around with people, joking around, and then the shoot comes along. Do you get into like a zone? I try to keep a flow going. That's my, my way of working is... I want everybody to be relaxed. I want it to feel like a hang. And uh, I mean, I'm, I work as hard as anybody, I guarantee it. Yeah. But I still like it to feel like I'm maybe not working as hard, you know? And, uh, and then sometimes I feel like I want to work hard and we connect on that level of like, this is working. Let's work hard at this and make it great. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's like putting on some great music and trying to distract people. A lot of times. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you're doing a cover and it's about like, you know, looking right at the camera and like keeping it simple and that sort of thing for like a magazine or something where you have a, uh, a concept where you need space around the artist or you're shooting something and you need to have a gutter because, you know, if you're doing an, uh, a spread. Right. And they ask you, hey, we want to run a double page spread. Well, you don't want to put the person in the center of the frame. Exactly. Of course. So those are things that are going through my head. But more and more, when I'm done with a photo shoot and someone says to me like, oh, that was, man, that was great. That didn't even feel like we were doing a photo shoot. I feel really good about that. So you think that's how you've been able to work with musicians so well? Because you're a musician. It's, it's, it is about the hang. And that's what, when, you, when you've toured, I mean, I've toured and worked with a ton of people, not as many as you, but they're just people and they just want to hang out. Right. And just have a normal conversation. And that's where the candidates come to life. Right. And, th and those are the, the documentary. Like you look at Jim Marshall's work all of those years. And I know you, you knew Jim. And it's just that stuff 
just when you look at his books, you sit there and you go, yeah, he knew what he, he was capturing because he, he was part of everything he was yeah. doing. And, and those guys were, there are some people who are there and took photos and there are some people that are there and took great photos. And Jim Marshall was definitely taking great photos you oh, know, yeah. with the opportunities that he had. And I've talked with people about what's different today in photography. Like, oh, you know, you, you were, you know, it was different when you were coming up. Like, you know, it's harder now kind of thing. Mm. And I'm like, well, you know, I've talked to and I, and, I, and I know a lot of the great rock and roll photographers, um, Mick Rock and Henry Diltz and Bob Gruen and Lynn Goldsmith and like all these people um, who really, I know for a fact that they started out because they loved taking photographs and they were hanging out with their friends and yeah. they were getting these opportunities and getting $25 from a teen magazine or something to, to shoot this stuff. When in fact, you know, they never thought that they were actually going to make a living at it. And, and so the point to take away from that is the idea that if you're passionate about something and you love it, just go for it and the rest will come. Don't try to make the money come first because it's oh, not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Well, especially know? with music. Yeah. I mean, today it's like, yeah, it, it is, you can say it's harder today, but I'm sure the people were saying it was harder then as well. Yeah. And it's, it's just what are you doing to be different to stand out? And it seems like the access is where it's at. I mean, you just ask. And we, I've said this a million times to everybody. They're like, how did you get access to do this and this? You ask. And you don't know how many emails I get back. And people are like, I just called these people and asked to do it. And they were like, yeah. I mean, what do you have to lose? I mean, it's, so for like you, that. where'd like your, that. your access come from? Did, did it just come from asking? <clears throat> yeah. And, um, and word of mouth working with people and them saying like, Oh, uh, you know, this one woman I spoke of earlier, Shelby Mead, she started, um, at Electra, I believe in, in, uh, in hip hop mm. and her and I met and we, you know, she was like, wow, I really like your style. I was young. She was young. And uh, she kept saying to her boss, you know, like, you should have Danny shoot something. And then I ended up shooting Pete Rock and CL Smooth for her. But then as time went on, she would recommend me to other people because I did a good job on that shoot. Right. And then she moved on and then she was working with, you know, the Beastie Boys and the Foo Fighters and all these people. And then, you know, her and I are like, we're like family, you know, so she trusts me. And so she tr knows she can bring me into the fold with these bands. Yeah because I've, I've shown that I'm capable of keeping my cool, staying out of the way, respecting other people's space, oh, yeah. you know, all those things that are really important. Um, I also, uh, there's a story I've told a bunch of times, um, I'll try to do the cliff note version of it, where I was here in New York City, shooting as many shows as I could, getting, getting my time in the pit, uh, here and there, different shows, whether I was at Irving Plaza, whether I was at, you know, Summer Stage in the, in there or at the Garden, I always saw the same guy uh, in the pit, this guy, Daryl. And I'd run by him and I'd be like, hey, man, you know, good to see you. You know, I'd go shoot my show and we'd have a little small talk. And one day I said to him, hey, uh, who's your band? Who do you love? Like, you're, you're at all these shows every day, you know, granted your back's to it, but you're hearing it. Mm -hmm. And he said, I like Pearl Jam. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah. So... I came around uh, next time around and I bought a print that I had shot of Eddie Vedder leaping off of uh, scaffolding silhouetted against the sky. And I was like, here, man, I got something for you. And I gave him this print. And he was, he was like, oh, man, this is great. Thank you so much. Now, your initial instinct, which is right as well, is to give some to the artist so they can see that you're a good photographer. But don't forget about the publicist who got you there. Don't forget about the, the guitar tech who let you get in that little spot on the stage. Yeah. So as... Um, now I run into Daryl, and Daryl's like, you can stay a little longer over here. You can do that. And we, oh, did you know that they're going to walk in on this side? Maybe you'll get them before they go on the stage, all that. So fa fast forward a couple of years, and I'm shooting the Dave Matthews Band for uh, some album packaging in San Francisco. And uh, the band, the van pulls up with the band, and you know we're at this location. And who climbs out of the car first but Daryl? So Daryl, who was like a front of house guy in the security team, had become friends with Dave Matthews band. They saw that he was really good at what he did. He's their guy. And now he's still their guy. Yeah. And it's all like, it's all becomes a circle of, you know, and the idea of 
treat everybody the way you want to be treated. Because if you don't, it's going to bite you in the ass when it comes around. And if you do, people are going to be like, hey, I remember that guy. He was great. Like, let's give him this opportunity. And that's why you don't screw people on the road. Because, and and that's, um, once you're on the road, the great thing is it's a family. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Within two calls, you can get to pretty much anybody. So once the, the, the fraternity of the, 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 the guitar techs and all of those guys, if once you befriend, I've befriended a plenty of them because they're great guys. They also make for good photos too with the beards and the tattoos and everything else they have. But what you were saying there reminded me of a story Bob Gruen was talking about when, when uh, what's Tina Turner and Ike Turner, somebody, his friend pushed him in front of Ike and said, show, here, show him the photo. And he showed him the photo took him back to see Tina and then that's how he got in with 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 her and yeah. that was that was cool stuff it's not too shabby no so how important is assisting I, I think it's huge I do um, you know there come there can be people who can get get past without it um, but I think you know for me I went to school uh, to a community college for two years. And then I went to new England school of photography in Boston and it was a great school for me. It was, uh, learn how to process film, learn how to print. Here's some, some classes on to give you a general outline on advertising and journalism and whatever, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, and it was great for me, but then taking that and going into assisting, was huge. My first uh, assisting job was I had I had saved up my money after I got out of school and I went to some photographic workshops, which were awesome because you're in, surrounded by people who love photography. You choose the, sh- the workshop with the instructors you love, and the instructor there was Annie Leibovitz, mm. and I ended up getting a job as an intern with her and working my way up to being one of her assistants. How how'd that happen? <clears throat> um, you know, I got there to the workshop and her assistant was there, and you know, workshops are great. There's a lot of variety of people there. You know, some people are never going to be more than a hobbyist. And uh, some people are going to try and go places. And I think, um, you know, I hit it off with her assistant. And about like three quarters of the way through the workshop, he said, I've been speaking with Annie and she told me to keep my eyes open for someone as an intern at the studio. And uh, we think that you might be the guy, you know, are you interested? And, um, And I was like, yeah, for sure. Uh, And so um, I ended up, you know, sweeping floors and getting coffee and running errands and all that sort of stuff and just slowly built my way up. And and it opened a lot of doors for me. And it also, you know, of course, when I was doing it, it's like I wanted to be Annie Leibovitz. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, you want to get out there. She's got great concepts and she's shooting presidents and she's shooting, you know, musicians and poets and movie stars. It's, It's awesome. And I think everybody asked me what my takeaway from, from, from her was. And, you know, part of it was how to work with the subject and how to not take no for an answer and how to get what you want done in an efficient way and working harder than ever. Uh, but I also learned that I realized that, you know, I wasn't Annie, you know, <laughs> it took me a while to, to let go of it and say, you know, I have my own personality. I have my own likes. I have my own ways of working and I have to embrace that. So, when I got out of there and when I worked with other photographers, I worked with Mary Ellen Mark, I worked with Lynn Goldsmith, I worked with um, Stephen Mizell for quite some time, which was an awesome experience, yeah. and, um, and a guy named Timothy White. And Timothy was a great mentor and is a great mentor of mine. He is a guy who is just a hustler beyond belief and is the go-to guy for photographing celebrities and doing movie posters and all that. And we became great friends and we both love motorcycles and cars and, and all that. Um, but the thing is, is when you get to a point where you're trying to d- discover your style, uh, you, I started to stress out, like, what is my style? Like, oh, my style, like, you know, how am I going to present my work in a way that's like cohesive, but still maybe... Um, diverse enough to get different jobs and and I realized you know in a nutshell it's basically I liked shooting with uh, a tri-x you know and I liked my old Nikon at the time I I just I didn't have my Leica yet but I like tri-x I like the wide lens I like to be in the middle of things I liked atmosphere I like cars and motorcycles and rock and roll and you know and I just said well there 
it's right there. I mean, it's right in my face, you know, black and white, wide, in your face, captured moments, cars, rock and roll, hip hop, you know, and it just, that's, it sort of just, it told me what my style was. You yeah. Know? And you have to, re, you have to remind yourself so you can discover it and let it happen naturally. And of course, you know, as you develop more, you, you, like you said earlier, I start to experiment after doing the same thing, you know, we're moving into color and moving into the studio and trying a four by five camera to slow myself down and not be so worried about capturing the moment in the atmosphere. Like I did all those things to help myself grow. Yeah. I was trying to figure out your style, not figure it out, but when I'm looking through the new book, um, I was just like the, the shots that they, they don't seem they have a, 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 they feel like you had an idea to, it's sort of like a setup, but it's still candid. It just seems like, you know, you got the black keys driving in a car. It's like, let's go drive and I'm going to shoot photos. So it, it still has the, the document, the documentary style of images there. Yeah. And I absolutely love how the book is set up because you have, you have the documentation, you've got your family stuff, you've got the, uh, the live. So it, it's broken down and it, and it puts, it puts everything where it belongs, I think. But it's still loose, you know, that's what I like about it, too. And some of them, like the portraits, could go into the friends and family or the or the documentary, and they kind of overlap in a way. But it was nice to section it out and give a little bit of structure to it. And um, my friend Stefan Nedzvetsky, who did the design for the book, um, has a company called Yard, and we do all the Varvedo stuff together. We've been doing it for, together for many, many uh, seasons. And he's a big music fan. But his style is very, uh, he's a super styly guy, he's really smart, and his stuff is very um, clean and um, not always, but, you know, it's organized and it's well thought out and it's very classic. And I feel like my work has a classic side only. I'm more messy and loose and kind of, you know, messy and loose, I guess. And I thought, what a great combination to, to do this book together. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, it ended up falling in the right place. And he's also a guy, he's not like a yes guy. You know, I'd, I'd said, he said, give me 400 images, you know, and I'll start to look through them. And I gave him like 1200 and he was like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I love all these images. Just start kicking them around, pairing them up. And we would go meet and we'd have everything up on a, on a foam cores and we would start to, um, put the layout together. Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, he really, and also he was a guy that would say to me, um, you know, look, I know you had a great time taking that photo and I know you like Bruce Springsteen, but you know, that's not the best photo, mm. you know? And I would be like, well, I'd either say, well, okay. Or I'd say like, well, I'm not going to budge on this one. I love this one. And he goes, okay, but I hate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he he's letting say, you know. I'd be like, thanks buddy. Well, at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that, that's the tough thing, though. It's like, I know people go to portfolio reviews and they have these people they pay to review their stuff and then they're giving them all the tips and they're like, but I don't agree with that. I love this image. I'm like, if you love the image, it's your book. Put out there what you want to put. That's one person's opinion. Right. There's another, like you could show it to the next person. They could tell you the exact opposite. So get everybody's opinion, put it in your mind. Absorb it. And, and then decide what works for you from there. So you were showing us some of the Blind Melon stuff. Is, yeah. is the Kickstarter still going for that? No, it's done. We raised about almost $115,000. And um, it, was, uh, a really, it was a really interesting process. I had never done one. And we got about halfway through, and we were still like, you know, 65% shy yeah. of uh, the money we needed. And... You know, we had a lot of ideas in our back pocket and we offered a lot of uh, incentives and things like that that were unique. And I had a little idea to reach out to some bands that I had met along the way who surprised me by saying, oh, Blind Melon was, I love Blind Melon, yeah. a huge influence on me. I often find myself defending them because people are like, oh yeah, the B-Girl and the No Rain. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know. Yeah. And, then, and and I met people like Jim James and the Avett Brothers um, uh, uh, Nicole Atkins, Joseph Arthur, um, and Brian Fallon from the Gaslight Anthem, and they they all 
were like, I love Blind Melon. I mean, this is what we listened to when I was coming up. And, you know, his voice is so unique and his writing was so unique and, and, and that sort of thing. And so I reached out to them and asked them if they would cut a Blind Melon song so that we could launch it and bring their fans to the table as well. Yeah. Uh, and to um, and encourage people, you know. Um, so uh, they did Jim James did the first one and um, Seth Aphit. Everybody did one. Joseph Arthur, who is one of my dear friends, um, was on tour and was, um, um, uh, he always supports me, but was unable to do uh, one this time around. But again, you know, these are people who, who love the band and they ended up releasing these things and getting them out there and it generated its own buzz. And even in the press, people were just talking about that and that was drawing people in. And so at the end of the day, when I thought I might need a little help from, you know, angels on the, uh, on the wings where we were saying, look, if I'm 10 grand short, can, you know, we cut a deal where you, you know, and I had people in who were offering to do that and we didn't need to, which is great, which is great. And now we're just in the process of, um, of just, you know, accumulating everything that we need, uh, and renting a new space and starting to just actually finish watching the footage because there's so much of it. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, the, what what struck me with with the images? Well, I'm drawn to the ground out negative carrier. Um, I remember when when I graduated from college, my entire portfolio, so I happened to be a sports portfolio, was all hockey because I was shooting the Flyers back then, and everything was ground out. And I know that I, I would take that to the Flyers game and show these professional photographers, and they'd be like, "What's this black border?" And I'm like, "Huh?" I'm like, "That's a full frame." And I'm like, "None of this is cropped." And that's something I never understood. A lot of people just, they, they, especially in sports, they crop. But what, what's your reasoning for not cropping? You know, I think when I worked for Annie Leibovitz, she, I did, I printed for her as well. And she had the filed out carrier and she had, but if she didn't do the filed out carrier, she was still printing full frame right to the border. Right. And I just, Honestly, I don't think I overthought it. I think that I saw that she was doing it, and I thought that's what a photographer with integrity does. Fill they the get frame. in there, and they fill the frame up, and they cr- and you know, Mary Ellen Mark you know, cropping in mm. here and Annie, and like just really creating that tension, natural tension around the photograph. And uh, it's just the way I shoot and the way it is. I mean, um, you know. It's a little kind of easier now when you're, you know, in the in a digital space and, you know, you see like a, there's some weird something at the end of the frame um, that to take out, you know, and um, I mean, I'm not going to be like overly ridiculous about it. You know, I'll crop in on something if I if I feel like it's going to make the photograph better. Sure. Um, but my theory is frame it up in the camera. And put a black border around it because that black border holds it in. It, yeah. it shows that, like, when you are looking through the frame, like, you know, this is your moment. This is when you click the shutter, and this is what was in the frame. And you know, it's it's great. And sometimes those mistakes or things that appear like they're in the way are what really gives the photograph its flavor. Right now, you you talked about shooting the black and white film. Uh, do you still shoot a lot of film? I do. I shoot a lot less film. Um, for example, I just did a shoot for Rolling Stone um, this past weekend. And, you know, it's a magazine. They're on a deadline, you know. Um, so I shot mostly digital, but I still shot about, like, uh, how many rolls of film did I shoot, Dan? For for the Rolling Stone thing. Yeah. Five. Five rolls of film. Right. But, you know, it's funny, that too. Oh, yeah. I did a shoot with Don Henley recently. I shot 40 rolls of film, which felt great. And the other thing is that the film cameras are the ones that you can, I mean, you can do double exposures and stuff digitally. I do that a lot too. It's fun. But, you know, you can't really fake like a Diana right. or like a Wida Lux or something. You just can't, yeah. you know. And it's also when you have it in your hand and the artist sees that Wida Lux, it's like, what is that? And it you just know? opens up the, yeah. it just opens them up and, and, sure, and, and they like, just wow. relax. Yeah. This guy's like, you know, he's bringing some interesting stuff to the table. This should be exciting. I'm they're They're looking forward to seeing it because well, they, they get so used to being shot by the same people over. Well, not yeah. the same people, but the, there's, there's a lot the of standard. the standard, like I'm shooting for a blog and let me just take some pictures. Right. And you, you know, you can 
tell the disconnect between certain photographers and, and, and certain bands, but sure. um, what, what are you rocking these days? Well, um, I like my favorite um, thing to do is to go with uh, this Leica M, which I really love. Uh, I've had it for about a year. Um, and then I have a, an M6 and an M4P, and I do... I rotate the M6 and the M4P if one needs to, if I've beaten one up for a while and it needs to go in and get cleaned, I just swap it out. Um, so I'll have a film Leica. I'll have my digital Leica, the M. And then I'll have like a 35 millimeter lens and a 75. So I got the 75 on the film camera. And then if I need to switch it out, I do that. So I feel like I'm really covering all the bases, you know, a wide lens, a longer lens. I don't really like to shoot with much longer lens, although sometimes it's necessary when you're shooting a concert. Right. Um, and then uh, if I'm, and this, that's when I'm rolling kind of casual. And I've been rolling a lot with just the M, which has been fun also. I like the 35 millimeter Summicron, and I just, I just roll around with that, and I could live my life with this camera uh, and be pretty happy. Yeah. Um, but I've noticed that uh, the one disadvantage to the M is when you put the longer lens on it, the 75, you can't really focus with the, uh, with the range finder. It's kind of weird, and it's, I hope they fix that in the future. Yeah, it's, it's a but, Leica. That's, it's supposed yeah. to be difficult. Yeah. yeah. Well. Um, but I also shoot with a 5D a lot. And then my other cameras that I shoot with are, um, I have some old Nikons, the FEs. I have a Hasselblad. Uh, I have a Wide Alux, a Diana, an old Fuji half frame. Mm. Um, I have the uh, the Hasselblad um, uh, panoramic camera, um, and then I have also the Holga. I said the Diana. I have a Konica Instapress which is the Polaroid pull and peel, mm -hmm. which I absolutely love. I shoot with that all the time. And um, I have, um, I think, uh, what else do I got? I got like some, you know, the old, we used to call it the golf swing camera, which is the four, the plastic camera that spins. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you shoot with that and it's all sorts of happy accidents happen. Yeah, those things, so those things were creative. That's pretty fun, yeah. So the, when was there the transition to, you know, you have your stills, mm -hmm. but then moving into moving pictures. Yeah. Uh, again, it kind of comes back to Robert Frank and Danny Lyon and my love of film, but knowing that those guys who I really admired um, were making films also. And I thought, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And their films were like pretty experimental. I mean, especially Robert Frank's. And I thought, I don't know, I like that. I like that idea. And, and um, I, had, I have no film making uh, training necessarily. And I decided to check it out. And I did like some small music videos for some friends of mine. And then I did a documentary with Ben Harper called Pleasure and Pain, which was my first documentary. And I just, I just went out with blind and just started shooting everything and trying to craft a story around uh, this guy and his his career and where he had come from and, and that was a really great experience um and uh uh, uh my friend Sam Lee a woman named Sam Sam Lee started as the editor and then became the co-director because she was so instrumental in schooling me on how to like make a film and not miss certain elements and leave them you know because you leave a big gap if you you miss certain things in the storytelling process it's not like a photograph where right. you're getting one thing you're you're trying to like tell the story in a different way and so that was a great learning experience for me all right so what's uh what's coming up next for you like what, what are you looking most forward to um well i'm going to bonnaroo which is always fun i'll do the portrait thing and uh and actually i'm not doing any other filming this is the first time in literally like probably 12 years that I'm only doing the portrait and just kind of running around documenting. So I'm super excited about that. Um, I am, I just did, uh, the 
a little short film and the publicity and album packaging for the new My Morning Jacket record, uh, which is an amazing record. I just did four videos for the new Alabama Shakes Sound and Color record, which is amazing. I mean, the band is so timeless, and they're just really on top of their game. It's really great stuff. I just did something with Don Henley. He has a solo record, and that's like uh, album packaging and then like a little documentary about where he is in his life at this time and what, why he made this particular record. Um, I'm going to a... Uh, I think I'm going to go to a photo... Uh, a, uh, a, a harmonica workshop mm. down in Mississippi, uh, which is going to be really fun. And, um, you know, um, we just did, um, I work with um, Milk Films uh, as a production company out of L.A., and we just did something for John Varvados. He's got like a fragrance uh, that's coming out. I do a lot of the John Varvados ads. Right. And um, I did the photography for that, and I also did the... Um, uh, the moving image part of it as well. So we're working on that. I also just did the new video for Zach Brown band, which uh, just came out. Uh, I did the album packaging and I did the video, which is really super cool. Uh, that's out right now. And then I also have um, this book. Um, I mean, you know this one because you reviewed it. And I loved your review. I really did. It was awesome. oh, you saw it. Nice. So this is a book called Motor Drive, right? Mm. So it's uh, photographs of musicians and their cars, uh, motorcycles, whatever it might be, right? So um, you getting a glare on that? No, 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 you're good. You good? You're good on that. Uh, Motor Drive. So I, a friend of mine, Alex Nowak, um, is an is a, a creative director and a great great guy, uh, lover of rock and roll and uh, and photography, and he was over here one day and we were kicking the tires on some ideas about like oh well, you know what can we do to, let's do something together, so we came up with this idea just sitting around here at the table with some wine and whatever, so I gave him a bunch of images, and he went to town on this thing. We decided we would do. Um, the cover in the the material that they used for the old car seats in the seventies. Yeah. Um, and we're, what we're doing is, um, we're doing, um, let's see if it's probably better that way. We're doing, um, 340, a limited edition of 340, which is the connotation is Tom Morello has a Dodge demon, a 71 Dodge demon. And it's got a 340. Mm. uh, eight V eight motor in there. And so we decided to do 340 of them. They'll be n numbered, uh, additioned and signed and all nice. that kind of stuff. And then, um, uh, <clears throat> there's my dad, you know, when I grew, I grew up around cars and motorcycles. Um, and then we have, uh, the, the forward is written by, by, uh, Tom Morello. Um, Bruce Springsteen, like, so what I do is I write a little bit of a story about the photograph on some of them. Um, but this story in particular is really sweet. Uh, I had done the album packaging for, uh, Bruce's record called Wrecking Ball uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, while we were, after we did the, the session, he invited me out into his car to listen to the record. Mm. And he's like, yeah, I'll play you a couple of songs. And I said, oh, great. So we go out there. Of course, he couldn't just play me a couple. He played me the entire record and was you know turning the volume down and telling me a little story about oh this is why i did this here and like i got this producer and this is why and we found this woman to, to sing some backup and it was just an amazing experience and yeah happening in a car is like it's such a cool uh vibe but i got the black keys and then like public enemy with their hot rods um let's see what else we got here uh mick fleetwood in hawaii with his little uh, austin healy uh, my my buddy's um, old Triumph from when I I took this. This is an old photo, but I love it for the dead thing. Um, Seth Avitt. So the whole thing, Tom Waits in the reflection in the hood of his car. Yeah. So we thought it would be cool, and it really it's become a really interesting little piece to have, and uh, ah, I'm cool super stuff. excited about it. No, they're awesome. I yeah. love this stuff. 
And they're, you know, they're not, I try not to be typical with it, you know, but there's only so many ways you can shoot it, uh, a, a car, but I think I found some ways to keep it interesting. And, but it's cool with the, yeah. it's the people and the car yeah. and the stories behind it. Right. And why is it that car and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's what so. makes it awesome. Yeah. This is one of the more abstract ones. This is Bruce Springsteen shot through the wheel of a, of a motorcycle mm. with uh, some other stuff there. So awesome. Um, oh, and this is me. With my 68 Firebird. Nice. And my feathered back hairdo. In Jersey. New Jersey. Very cool. So that's that. Um, this is um, uh, a book I made of um, all those pull and peel with my Konica. I was telling yeah. you about that Konica camera. And this is like, you know, a happy accident where the chemistry didn't didn't land right. Right. And it just it didn't read. So it's, not a, it's not a filter, you know. It's no. not, you just didn't hit a button and then. Right. And this <laughs> is all natural framing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, Keith Richards, Bonnie Vare. Nice. Wow, those are, that pull and peel is <coughs> awesome. God, sorry. That's all good. It, it mm. gives you such an... You said you scanned the back of uh, what was left. Yeah, and there's like fingerprints on it and all kinds of craziness. That makes it awesome. Mm. So... There was this festival in New Jersey this weekend. The Mumford and Sons does like Gentlemen of the Road. Right. And my, my blues band, the Tangiers Blues Band, played <clears throat> played uh, the late night show. And um, Taylor from Dawes came and jammed with us. And the, Ted and uh, Chris from um, Mumford and Sons. And then I I sang some songs. And I don't I don't usually sing too often. So I I totally shredded my my voice. Throat and, coat. Uh, it was sure it was worth it, though. No, nah, that's mm. awesome. Anyway. Really cool. So, yeah, double exposure. This happened in camera. So this was right in. I just clicked it. I didn't pull it. And then I switched the light to the other side. Uh, and and so this is a natural, you know, happy accident where this kind of dissected there. And that's great. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So when, when can we expect the book? Um, This book is almost done. We're, we're basically, um, it's printing right now. And we actually hand stamped this in, so we have a uh, we have a branding kind of iron sure. with this built into it. Just press, stamp it down, Boom. you know. And how's this bad boy doing? <clears throat> this is doing great. I'm telling you, I probably have about eleven thousand of those out in the world. And um, I spoke to the Abrams people uh, who published the book, and they said they couldn't be happier in that there's no returns on the book. And oftentimes when they put a lot of books out there that, you know, if they're not selling, they get returned. And, um, I mean, I've sold, I've done a bunch of book signings and uh, I've had these certain parties and stuff and I've just sold, sold a bunch of them. And I mean, I think what I'm most proud of, uh, with this book and, uh, is, is that, you know, people, you never want to really be pigeonholed in your photography. Like, you know, of course I wanted to be Annie Leibovitz or Irving Penn or Avedon where you're like, Oh, you're shooting, you know, um, a president and an author and an actor and a fashion spread and a this and a that. And I've gotten to do like a lot of that stuff. Um, but you know, being a music photographer, so to speak, or being known as people have said, you know, Oh, the right, this guy's the rock and roll photographer, you know, and I, I try to remind them, you know, what I'm most proud of is that I actually got my start in hip hop mm. and I did the Nas Ilmatic record. I did Kanye's first record. I did Red Man and Public Enemy and LL Cool J and all that. And that led to all of the um, alternative bands, let's just say, uh, who all loved Public Enemy and saw my portfolio. And then that's how I ended up working with the Smashing Pumpkins and Blind Melon and you know, chili peppers and all that sort of stuff because they're all fans of that work as well. And then it just went from there to then it's like Bruce Springsteen and Neil Young and then Tony Bennett and Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash. Mm -hmm. So you've got Metallica over here and you've got Tony Bennett over here and everything that's in between. And it's it's been really a great ride for me and it's been very exciting to interact with all those people and have the, all those great life experiences yeah. that um, I can hold on to. And, and um <clears throat> And then this is the proof of that. So that's an awesome really book. Super, super exciting. And I know a lot of people. You can pick it up on Amazon. Still moving. Danny Clinch. It's awesome. Yeah. Danny, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, man. Enjoy the Bonnaroo and enjoy whatever else is coming up next. Thanks. You're welcome. 
So that was an awesome interview. Did you enjoy that day? Yeah, that was an awesome day in general. So what he gave us a tour of his place. Yeah, very cool place, man. Yeah, he he bought it like a. 15 years ago or something the right time well i don't know that wasn't the right time (laughs) that wasn't the right that was pre 9 11 oh yeah so the prices were probably higher i was thinking it was after yeah yeah no so it's like you never know but whatever he has that that studio to work out of um we see where the prints are made he was pulling out old boxes of just it's like here check out this box this box says jim marshall on it this box says like uh sublime or Bruce springsteen dave matthews band just uh, boxes and there was bo- neil young I, yeah and then he had he had drawers and drawers of stuff and then he showed us his old his all of his different fun toy cameras yeah. or not just toy cameras but different things that keep him creative so what are these things called cds on the shelf I didn't know what they were, but CDs nuts. Yeah, he had <laughs> CDs up on the shelf. They're like, this is where we used to store music. These are digital. <laughs> this is. I mean, they're not digital. Actually, it's called Spotify. Yeah, yeah, right. It's called Spotify. No, but it, it was, it was a. I was sitting there during the interview, just thinking that I've been trying to do this for years. Yeah, and this was like an accomplishment that I wanted to do, and I was there. Well. And, and me working in the, the music industry prior to working with you for the past uh, seven or eight years, I've just heard his name over and over yeah. again. And it's funny, when I came back that day, I looked on my wall and I have various signed posters and uh, uh, album covers and stuff like that. And if you look closely, the label still usually cites Says, the photographer yeah. and Danny Clinch is on half of them. I have a Death Cab for Cutie poster. He he photographed a um, whole bunch of other ones and i, I like that wow. he, you know he didn't want to be known as just like a music photographer yeah but he's got commercial to me he, I, he captures I know life one. yeah but that and that's the thing that we discussed is like photojournalism which so happens to be the music you're working with musicians who give you uh so, somebody interesting to photograph yeah and they have a larger following so that's why your work becomes seen and then it's just cool how jobs come and how and how he went from assisting to getting his own things and to where he's going, you know, now. And how much he's getting into filmmaking, too. In well, general. yeah, he's been doing filmmaking for a long time. Documentary type, yeah, filmmaking. So it's, you know, it, it was great. I really appreciate that he let us uh, come in. Super especially nice guy, that yeah. he was going to Bonnaroo the next day. Um, I can see us talking to him in the future because he was just really great to, to sit. It's just, it's great when you can go in. It, it, he's like, wow, nice setup. Yeah. He liked the setup, which yeah. is, we, we go with a... Uh, a raw setup that's it's light very and small, raw travel but it, setup but it looks it great works. and uh you know it, it was a it was a great interview and i was glad you were there to do that and it was I wanna, a fun busy day too oh in yeah general. we did have a busy day yeah but it was worth it mm-hmm. so that's that guys that is the interview with danny clinch go check out more information about the book danny clinch.com you can get the book still moving signed on his website or you can pick it up on Amazon or at a local bookstore, wherever you would like to do that. So, Stephen is going to go get the wheel of Fro into place because we are going to jump right to the wheel of Fro because I do have a person's name on here, but I won't tell it to you until later. But now it gives me a good time to talk about everything that is on the wheel of Fro. Is it lined up right? It doesn't. It doesn't give me that ear thing like the other one did. No. Nope. Oh yeah, it just gave it to there me. Because now I ah oh, ah. Uh, what? It's just it, because it's weird the way that your voice hits me now. Before it would have to bounce off the back wall and yeah. bounce back. Now it goes like this right into my head. It's crazy, right? In my head. In my, in my head. head. Zombies. 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 Yeah. <laughs> is it plural zombie? Is it zombies or is it zombie? I think it's zombie. Thought it was zombies. Zombie. 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 I'm pretty sure the song's called Zombie. Zombies with your tanks and your bombs and your guns and your gun. In my adoramapix.com, they, you, if it lands on that, you get some free crap. Yes. They're running a 20% off sale on everything, and the code is popping up on the screen because I don't remember what the code is. It was. No, not that code. Oh, it's, it's a new code, code mm. that they're doing 20% off of everything at Aramapix. Which, by the way, last week when you wrote it down on the back of your paper, you flip-flopped it. You, I did? You, yeah, you, you switched it around. Did you fix it? I fixed it, I yeah. dyslexed it? Yeah, you, you, you were a little dyslexic on it. I don't think you have the paper with you right now. I, but right I made there. sure to have the proper code up top. What was wrong with this? It was PX first. Oh. That's how you flip-flopped it. Oh. Yeah. Well, screw them. I was like, wait, which, which, which code is it? Well, I hope you people took advantage of it because that was a test. <laughs> Just a test. All uh, right. Uh, Fro Prize, you win my face. 
Think Tank, you get a bag from Think Tank. Audioblocks.com slash go slash fro. Get your free trial. Lexar, if it lands on Lexar, you get some stuff. Lightroom, you get a creative cloud for one year. Photography bundle. Photography bundle. Rode microphones, we use those each and every week that we can uh, for as much as possible. Even when we're out in the Grand Canyon, Canyon. we use these. Yep. But remember, you may be able to buy the best microphones in the world. (laughs) But if you don't know what you're doing when it comes to audio, like me, it may not sound good. (laughs) But if you are like Steven and you can make the audio sound good, they give you an amazing raw file to work with, a nice pattern or something. Is that what they call it? Patterns? <laughs> yes, waveform. And then you can do some stuff with it, like Steven does. Uh, question mark, if it lands on that, you get to pick anything on the wheel, including the spin again, if that's why you want to be risky. I don't know, because maybe they want the big prize. Yeah, I mean, it is risky, but... Borrowlenses.com, $250 in credit. Fro prize, squarespace.com slash fro to get your 14-day free trial, no credit card needed. Woo-hoo. And then you get 10% off with the code fro. Take advantage of that. Uh, videoblocks.com slash go slash fro. Same things apply, as we've said before, and in the pluggy McPluggerson that they gave us this week. Lexar card one more time. We use those cards in these cameras. We got one there, one there, Atomos over there. Lexar 128 card up in the GoPro Hero 4, which is not recommended, but it works. We got one the Zoom 2 and the backup Oh, zoom. we have the Zoom and the backup mm-hmm. Zoom. Holy shit, we use a lot of Lexar cards, a lot of cards these days. Black Rapid, get your Black Rapid strap, the RS Sport, or whatever from Black Rapid Road. <laughs> Some kind of strap. Something like that. Spin again, and you have right here the Atomos Ninja Dose. Ninja Deuce, Ninja 2. It's like $700, but if you get a bare bones when that comes out, you'll be happy. And the bare bones is just the AC adapter and pretty much just the actual unit. Can't Where go we wrong were, with that. We weren't sure if it was the battery it or the AC adapter. I looked it well, up. Yeah. Good for you. I try. Good, thank you. So I'm going to spin it right now, and we have, um, not telling you who it's spinning for, change up the Wheel of Fro spin for me. Change up the wheel for a spin? Yeah, we got we to gotta move on. It's time for a new one. What am I going to say? Like, spin that wheel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> spin that wheel. All right, ready? Yeah. Spin that wheel! <laughs> yeah. I think I moved it a little bit. You always Not move much. it. Not much. Every time. Around and around it goes. Where it stops, nobody knows. The wheel of fro is about to stop on the best prize on the wheel Ever. 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 Road microphone, road microphone, Lightroom. Photography bundle. Oh Oh my God, man. Breathe. Don't die on me. Take a breath. (laughs) Congratulations goes out to Mike Ellsworth of California. You have won that thing on the wheel. <laughs> what? Uh, your face is just so red. Is you, it red? Yeah, it was. It's not now, but oh, it was pretty good. I'm so good at I, I have great I have great lung capacity from that never was, smoking that was a pretty cigarette. Solid, yeah, probably. Yes. So guess what time it is? Uh, not wheel of fro time. But no, it's the end of the sh- it's the end of the show. My time. favorite time. Whatever. Thank you goes out to audio blocks, yes. video blocks, Always. and graphic stock. Thank you for Sutter for the last yeah. long while that he's been on the show. Salute you, sir. The seat is now ready to be filled by the next person who wants to take the journey and get some good edumacation and some other good perks that come along with that. Thank you to Danny Clinch and everybody oh, up yeah. there at Danny Clinch's studio for being very supportive to us. I sent them a bunch of t-shirts, oh, so nice. they're going to get a bunch of t-shirts. I remember you asked for their sizes And that maybe day. some bobbly heads, Ooh. and they will be really excited to get that stuff. But it was an awesome interview. Check out that book, like we said before. Uh, you can get all the photo news and more at frontosphoto.com slash rawtalk-138. And don't forget to tip your waiters and your bartenders because... <laughs> They work hard for two dollars and twelve cents an hour. Where did that come from? I just I always hear the like when you're at a strip club, which I've never been. I was at a strip club once and I, I hated went it. Once and I hated it. Yeah. When you're at a bar and they're like uh, and a band's playing like a cover band, don't forget to tip your waiters and waitresses. Oh. Or or at a comedy show, yeah. Don't forget to tip. Take care of them. They're taking care of you. Mm-hmm. You know stuff like that. So that that's where I got that okay. from. Okay, now it makes sense. That's all I got. A little random. I do randomness from time to time, mm-hmm. and uh, don't forget to sign up uh, for the podcast. 
Mm -hmm. because that's what I wanted to say. I got to do that one. You can subscribe to the podcast so that you will be one of the first people to download it automatically on the iTunes. And when Spotify allows me to figure out how to get my podcast up there, we'll get it on the Spotify as well. I'm sure soon. Yep. You know what's weird is uh, I got the app. It updated on my iPhone, but the color is different. Mm. It's more like a, a teal teal green mm. than what it was before. Before it was just like a green like this. Mm. It's very odd. Odd. I thought it was weird. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. That's where I'm going to leave. <laughs> and that is the end of the show. That has been Raw Talk episode number 138. Jared Pullen. Froknows. Photo.com. See ya.